It's a great honour to be asked uh, to speak to you today and to deliver the plenary address to your conference. I wanted to talk about the topic of building personal resilience for research on climate change and biodiversity loss and really my theme is balancing hope and realism. So in outline I'm going to break this presentation into two parts. The first part I'm just going to dwell on the problem of despair and burnout a bit and I want to start with the story and then work through some issues about how climate change and biodiversity loss pose immense threats Yet the policy response to both has largely been a shrug of the shoulders. You know, we've got the Paris Agreement and the like, but look at in Australia at the moment, we're having this debate about essentially the National Energy Guarantee, which is pretty well code for let's do nothing about climate change, but claim that we are doing something. So really it's, it's just a, a fig leaf on a very bare climate change response. At the same time, we're drowning in data, drowning in data. And more data seems unlikely to change the ingrained political antipathy, apathy and inaction. So given this, how can we, as researchers in, you know, in this area, how can we deal with that? That there's this massive problem that we know is, is here and is damaging things right now, things that we love, and yet there's such inaction about it. So that leads into the second part, which is finding your answer and I want to suggest to you five strategies. Can I begin with a story and it's a story about me but about you as well uh, because you might have seen if anyone was looking at ABC website yesterday there's this fantastic story uh, about uh, Professor Jamie Kilpatrick down in Utah's who's done a huge amount of work over many decades for conservation, research into and conservation into the Tasmanian heathlands and the incredible biodiversity. And it's a wonderful, wonderful science story. And if you, haven't, if you didn't see it yesterday, go and have a look for it because it is just a beautiful story. It was very much a story though about fighting to protect the places you love because it really starts with um, Jamie saying, you know, the first time I went out onto the Heathland, I just fell in love with it. And he's basically devoted his life to conservation in that area. And my story is really the same. It's about fighting to p protect the places and people that I love. And I know that that's a common story, I'm sure, for many of us. So this is a picture of um, me and my dad, um, back when I was a wee lad um, in the 1980s. I'm standing on Whitehaven Beach and I remember that day it was the sand was so bright I remember the camera and I'm squinting there because the sand was just like glowing white and I couldn't look at the camera and we were standing uh, in Hill Inlet which is just you see the sort of inlet going in from the beach Whitehaven Beach is that big white beach stretching into the distance and then Hill Inlet is this estuary that goes in um, to Whitsunday Island, so it's in the middle of the Whitsunday. So I was born in Proserpine, grew up in the Whitsunday region. This is a picture of um, my brother, um, an uncle, and myself spearfishing back in the 1980s in the Whitsundays. And I grew up surrounded by cane fields, so living on the coast, everywhere in that area is cane, other than the hills. If it was flat, we've cleared it and put cane. Put cane. I remember distinctly remember the creeks um, around where I lived. It pretty well was just a depression where the cane went through. So when I was 15, I had this idea that you know there's all these scientists who have all this knowledge, and there's all these lawyers and politicians that make all the decisions, and they don't seem to be able to communicate very well. So I thought, you know, I, I. I think I can study like something like science and law and be a translator between the two. So my idea when I was at high school was to be a translator. So that's the beginning of a very winding path that leads me here. So I, in the 1990s, I did a ecology degree, a science degree here at UQ and a law degree, so science law. Then I went and worked um, for the environment department up in Townsville for a couple of years. Um, I came back, did a Master of Laws at QUT and started my PhD. I, I did a, a, a Master's by coursework and just really enjoyed it and just rolled into a PhD and in law there's basically no one does PhDs so you know you're like 
I remember at graduation it was like 400 undergraduates and two PhDs graduating. So PhD in law part-time while I was working as a barrister and then a while back I, well, I worked as a lecturer here in the school. I finished a few years ago and gone back to um, working as a barrister. So I've been a teacher and also I'm really interested in public education. So some of the litigation stuff I do about public education is on my website and I wanted to just dwell on one case that I've been working on a lot over the last few years. It's a big about big pieces of litigation against the Adani um, mine, the Carmichael coal mine. So I'm sure you've seen it in the news, there's been a huge amount of protest against it. And so uh, the mine is proposed in central Queensland, west of Mackay. It's enormous and, and if you've never really been involved in the coal sector, it's really hard to actually understand how big these things are. They are flipping enormous. So this um, mine is 25 kilometres east to west, 32 kilometres north to south. If you try and place that over Brisbane, let's start with UQ, UQ is about one kilometre across. If you took a four by four kilometre grid square and starting in UQ, it would stretch to the city, go all the way across to Woolloongabba and then um, all the way across to Tuong. So put your hand up if you, if you live somewhere in that grid square. Okay, so that is one of about 20 pits at the Carmichael Mine. Now imagine if you took that area and you dug out 150 metres of dirt, like 150 metres, not like, you know, just scrape the surface, dig a massive hole 150 metres deep and move it. It's enormous. Now that's just one pit. The actual mine, if you stretched it from UQ north, it would go all the way to Petrie. And if I just put it, lay it across Brisbane, just in terms of the layout, so I've just got a four kilometre, see this bar down here, marking four kilometres. If we stretch the mine across Brisbane, it would stretch from Logan home all the way through to Chermside. So imagine that, basically eight kilometres strip for 30 odd kilometres going down 150 metres. It is enormous. Now put your hand up if you're somewhere in that footprint. That's going to be pretty well everyone here. So this is an enormous hole in the ground, an enormous amount of coal. And the final approvals for this mine were given in the midst of um, what Justin Marshall described uh, here at UQ, described as Australia's biggest ever environmental disaster. That was the third major coral bleaching event occurred in 2015-2016. So this bleaching was, the Great Barrier Reef was being completely hammered in early 2016. The final major approval for this mine was granted in March of 2016. So um, this mine being approved while we've got this massive damage occurring. And we already know that current climate conditions, you know, we've had three massive coral bleaching events around the world, 98, 2002, um, 2015, 2016. So global, you know, massive bleaching, um, just incredible damage, we already know that climate conditions are too high for coral reefs. We already know that. And yet our plan as a, as a global community is to go higher. We're currently at about one degree warming. Our plan is to stabilise somewhere beneath two degrees or maybe 1.5 degrees, but you know, two degrees is okay. So we're already seeing coral reefs hammered and our plan is to basically go a lot higher. So this is um, an image from a paper by Ophir Goldberg published in, and colleagues published in 2007 in Science and they looked at what they thought coral reefs would look like under different climate scenarios. On the left is basically the scenario at, at that time about one degree warming, coral reefs damaged but still pretty healthy. The one in the middle is at two degrees, so pretty well weedy, weedy covered assemblages and then above three degrees, pretty well just rubble. So that's what the leading science is saying, that coral reefs are under huge threat at two degrees, which is the global target under the Paris Agreement. 
So we know coral reefs are incredibly threatened right now. So in the midst of all of this science and all of this damage that's occurring, our governments have granted approval for the largest coal mine in Australia, one of the largest in the world. And what that says to me is it's not just that we're, we haven't learned what we must do to protect the reef. It's that we're actively moving in the wrong direction to protect it. We're actively doing the things that we know are going to stuff it. Charlie Vernon, one of the leading coral reef researchers um, really ever, named so many thousands of corals around the world, said about the decision to grant the approvals for the mine that it defies reason. And I just think that sums it up. It defies any logical reason other than if you bring in greed. And when you bring in greed, it can make sense at a immediate level, but from the perspective of actually protecting the places we love um, and maintaining our society into the future, it defies reason. So I often ask this question. Um, it's a thing that's driven me for a decade, is will we leave the Great Barrier Reef for our children? That question. I think it's the only question you need to ask about our climate and energy, energy policies. And if the answer to that isn't yes, clearly, then there's something incredibly wrong with what we're doing. And unfortunately, the answer that we're giving to that right now is no, a resounding no, we're not going to. We're not even really going to try. We're going to say we're going to try, but we're actively doing the opposite. Climate change and biodiversity loss pose immense threats to the natural environment and society. So in that context, the policy response hasn't been adequate, it's largely been a shoulder shrug. You know, the, I've mentioned the Paris Agreement, two degrees is curtains for coral reefs, and yet that's our objective. And even that, Australia is not going to meet. Like on our current policies and the current political debate, it's not going to happen. So, and to mix metaphors, and it's not just um, a shrug of the shoulders, we actively put our fingers in our ears and say, no, 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 you can't, I can't hear you climate scientists. You conservation scientists can't hear you. So that's essentially our Australian and Queensland government's response to these threats. Um, this is a picture of uh, Premier of Queensland shaking hands with the um, uh, chairman of um, the Adani Group in December 2016. So this is the you know this is the early early 2016. There's a Great Barrier Reef is hammered by climate change. End of 2016, this was a shake of the hands about uh, royalties and you know, use of the port in Townsville. So still actively encouraging the project. So after Australia's biggest ever environmental disaster, you really wonder if that is not a red flashing light saying don't do this, then what the hell is? Now, we're drowning in data about this. We have got so much data, it is just, we're swimming in it. Absolutely swimming in it. I only have to mention the IPCC reports. Most people probably look at them online. If you've ever looked at them in hard copy, they are, well, there's four volume, there's three working groups, there was four volumes in the last one. They are each a phone book. A thousand pages long, packed, packed with references and just essentially summarizing the science absolutely massive amounts of information that they summarise. And then everyone knows these sorts of graphs, they're famous. Um, so we know that global temperatures have been rising. You know, 2017, another record-breaking year. Um, you've all seen these sorts of images with the Arctic just absolutely cooking, like just really scary. You look at that stuff and you go, bloody hell. That is really, really scary. And this is some of the, the um, presentations of the impacts from the 2016 coral bleaching event. The northern section got absolutely hammered. And why that is really scary is because that was the, that's the most pristine area and our whole strategy to this point has been to build up resilience for corals. And what the 2016 event showed us was that basically it doesn't matter if they're pretty healthy to start with, come through with a, um, a, a marine heat wave, it's going to kill them all. So our whole resilience strategy 
we might as well run down the road naked because it's pretty well that, that, that much use. So we know that the reef has already been hammered and going into the future it is likely to be. And when we present the data, it's not just you know, graphs. We, you know, we, people talk about data visualisation. You know, here is a great visualisation to present to politicians, to present to the public. Here is a reef in American Samoa, healthy in December 2014, dying in February 2015, dead in August 2015. Okay, that is a great data visualisation, excellent um, snapshot to give to a politician, to give to the public to say, this is a big deal. And does it even really cause a blink of the eyes? Hardly, it just sort of rolls on. Here's another one, this is um, before and after March and May 2016, Lizard Island and the GBR, bleached in March 2016 covered in algae in, uh, in a couple of months later. And we've known this for a long time. This is um, the abstract from O.Q. Goldberg's classic paper back in 1999, published in Marine Freshwater Research, Climate Change, Coral Bleaching and the Future of World's Coral Reefs. This was after the first global coral bleaching event, and I just highlighted a section there. He, he suggested the results suggest that the thermal tolerance of reef building corals is likely to be exceeded every year within the next few decades. Events as severe as the 1998 event, the worst on record, are likely to become commonplace within 20 years. Fast forward 20 years, he was right. So we've known this. We have known this for a long time and done very little. So the alarm bells rang loud and clear in 1998 for coral reefs, one of the Earth's most important ecosystems, which millions of people depend on for food and livelihoods. And the response was largely a collective shoulder shrug. Oh well. We put our fingers in our ears and just pretty well kept doing what we were doing. You know, our plan as an Austra the Australian and Queensland governments, their plan is to dig up and burn all of our coal and all of our gas. And if you were to suggest anything else, um, you walk into a um, minister's office and suggest that we should leave most of the coal in the ground, they would call security because there is a crazy person in their office um, that you know, must be taken away straight away, even though that's what the science is saying. So um, this is, a, I think, a great quote. Obviously, we're not the only country to be digging up and burning all their fossil fuels. Pretty well everyone that's got them is doing it. Um, Canada, tar sands. Um, you know about, um, and the former Canadian Environment Minister compared the country's position on greenhouse gases, pledging to reduce emissions on one hand while increasing tar sands production on the other, like attempting to ride two horses galloping in opposite directions. It's pretty well our approach on climate change and energy. Um, attempting to ride two horses galloping in opposite directions. That's what it looks like, and that's what it looks like. Okay, so given this, how can researchers manage feelings of personal despair and burnout? So I want to go to the second part of um, my presentation. So finding your answer. And I want to suggest five strategies. The first strategy is be kind to yourself. Remember why you started your journey. It's not all on you. And I, I want to give you a, a personal um, story here. Uh, this is a couple of pictures of a, a friend of mine, Jared Harris. So he's the boy in the middle, and I knew him in primary school. Um, yeah, he's a great mate. And anyway, in the start of 2012, I got an email from him. I hadn't talked to him for 20 years. He had been working in South Korea, teaching English, and um, he'd seen me in some ABC talk about calcium gas or something, he'd seen me online and got in contact and I said, oh, Jared, great to hear from you, mate. Look, next time you're coming back through Brisbane, stop by, it'd be great to catch up. And um, thought, you know, that looking forward to seeing him. A few months later, I got a call from a friend to say Jared had committed suicide. And I don't know why he committed suicide. I went to his funeral up in the Wood Sundays, or his it wasn't a funeral, it was a wake. Um, I don't know why he committed suicide, never, never asked, it didn't really matter. Um, but I often think, you know, when, since then, I've thought um, when I fail or, you know, I wish I had better skills to be able to do more, 
often think about Jared and think, you know, why did you do it? Right? Like, what, what could have been so bad? And I think, you know, for all of my failings and inadequacies and the things that I can't do well enough, like I'm, a, I'm an okay barrister, but I see, um, typically I'm against mining companies and they always get the best because they can pay anything. So I'm typically, like, imagine an average fighter going in to face the world heavyweight champion in every round. I'm the average fighter who gets belted all around the ring. Um, and, and, you know, I often feel inadequate that I am not a better barrister. And I suppose part of me also thinks of Jared and thinks, hey, I'm there and there's <laughs> often no one else. So I should, you know, be, appreciate the things that I can do well. And I'd just say that to you. You know, I think the first strategy for dealing with despair and grief and these sorts of feelings when, you know, if you're losing places you, you love, like we are losing the Great Barrier Reef now, a place that I grew up and love, and I think of the incredible suffering that it's going to cause hunger for all of the countries that depend on coral reefs, and we're, we're doing it now, and we, we know what we're doing. It's not like we don't have any idea about the suffering that's going to cause. It's like we like to imagine that we're not going to cause it, but we know, the science is saying it's clearly we're going to cause huge suffering and damage. So in that context, be kind to yourself and do what you can. So remember why you started your journey in your PhD, your research, you know, your studies. The second strategy I'd like to suggest to you, apart from being kind to yourself, is see your career as a marathon, not as a sprint. I actually learnt this um, here at UQ. It wasn't a marathon, but there used to be a run when I was a young whippersnapper in undergrad. There used to be a run. It was a 5K run that would start at the um, athletics oval and would go around the back and then come around the colleges and do a loop around and go back to, it was a 5K run. I presume they still have it. But I remember learning that um, it doesn't really matter if you sprint the first 100 metres and sprint the last 100 metres. It's what's happened out the back when you know, you're know you plodding away. you know If you don't have a good pace, you're still gonna do a bad time. So I run a few marathons as well, and I've also <laughs> learned that you can't sprint the first half because it is, it is a terror. <laughs> the second half is just terrible. I say that from experience. Um, and your career isn't just going to be you know, one year or two years. I think it's, I, this has been my experience, it's really common to see in the conservation sector, people come in and they're really keen, you see them at every event, um, every protest, every meeting, they're involved in all of these things, they're always on email and the like, and they're incredibly committed. And often, in my experience, those people go really hard for a couple of years and then they drop out. They find that they're not achieving what they hoped they would, they find that living on the breadline, because if they're working in the conservation sector, they're getting basically paid very little money. They drop out and they go to something that they get paid for but isn't really in the conservation sector. Don't let that happen to you. Um, I think it's really important to see your career as like 30 years. So you need to set a pace that you can maintain. Um, Ron, I heard the, your, the, the last part of the... the um, panel discussion and you um, talked about how you know when you were a um, PhD student you were really worked really hard and then you learnt in your 40s about having a family and, and that question of balance and it's true you know when you're young and you don't have a family you can work with these really long hours and it, it's much harder when you've got a family but you you want to have it might be okay to work really hard for a bit but you can't maintain it it will just you will burn out um, and yeah, it's no good. So see your career, I think, I think a good metaphor is see your career as a marathon. You know, that you're going to hopefully be doing great things in your, in your field for 30 years, not just the next two or three years during your research. You know, life will go on after that and you want to set a pace that you can maintain. So that links to the third strategy I'd suggest, which is recharge regularly. And this is exercises you're obviously and you know if you look at 
websites about depression like Beyond Blue and, and like they always say, you know, get out and exercise, spend time with your friends. Those are two basic strategies. So exercise, great. But can I say um, the second one as well, spend time with your friends, family and doing things you love. The third one I actually learned um, about taking weekends off and turn off the news and take holidays. I've learned through basically burning out um, as a barrister, but also um, I learned it, uh, I was in the Al Gore climate um, training years ago, and they did talk there about burnout, and I thought one of the best things that, I, that they suggested was, on weekends, either don't look at the news, or you know, basically switch things off. I know that that's hard now, we've all got our mobile phones and we can get all our emails instantly, and it's hard not to check the news and the like. Um, but a strategy that, that if you, yeah, if you're going to check the news, one thing that you might do is just keep your your work to say, if possible, nine to five Monday to Friday, so that you actually take weekends. I remember when I started as a barrister, I wasn't taking any weekends and I wasn't taking any holidays. And after I always got to Christmas, and there was always some urgent case that had to be done. It was due in January, so I didn't take holidays um, one year. Next year there was a surgeon case in February and, and I didn't take holidays. I got to the third year and I realised I actually hadn't taken holidays for years. And I got to realise there was always something urgent that was just around the corner that you had to prepare for. And I, one thing that I did try and do was, yes, take holidays around Christmas, but also try not to do things on the weekends. Like if you're in the conservation sector, don't go to, you know, don't have meetings and the like, don't do things on the weekends. Make it your time. Take time out to be you and spend time with your friends and family. And I think that's a really valuable strategy. So recharge regularly. Um, so this is just a picture of me recharging down in uh, the Western Arthurs in um, southwest Tasmania, a place that I absolutely love. This is above Lake Oberon in the Western Arthurs. And this is a picture that I took a few years ago, um, oh, just over in Stradbrook Island, a lot closer to home. But yeah, it was just a beautiful um, sunset. My youngest daughter, or well, now my oldest daughter now, my only daughter at the time, <laughs> um, was playing in the surf. That, that isn't her, but she was basically just behind me when I took this picture. And it was just, you know, an absolutely idyllic, beautiful Stradbrook Island weekend. So, you know, take weekends, take time off, um, and see it as not that you're uh, avoiding work or shirking your work, but it actually means that you can go longer and it's, you know, you will be keep going in years to come and not just burn out. And um, this is um, a class that I, I used to teach international environmental regulation here in the school. And this is my class, I always take them down to Springbrook, um, which is an area around Brisbane that I absolutely love and try and get back to to recharge. And so here's the class lined up behind a waterfall. And here's one of the students a couple of years later. We always used to run a photo competition, which I thought was a great way to have all these people going around with these big cameras. And there'd be some beautiful pictures like this. So um, this is one of the students standing on the walk in this area. You can walk behind the waterfalls. So that's why there's, she's dry and the water behind is coming down. And this is another picture of one, another student up there in the top right, you can see. And I always emphasise to the students that it's really important. And one of the reasons for going down to Springbrook with them was to really emphasise it's, it's so important to stay in touch with the wonderful places and people that you love. Um, and they will recharge you during your career and remind you of what you're working to protect. So I often go down to Springbrook because hey, it's a lot closer than the Western Arthurs. Um, but it's you know really beautiful and um, yeah uh, a wonderful place. So recharge yourself and don't see it as you know that you're not working hard enough. You are. You need to take time out. So um, the fourth strategy after recharging yourself. This might sound strange. The fourth strategy is to accept that it is actually rational to despair in the face of the crises face that we face. You look at the science, you look at the politics, it looks really bad. And it's rational to think, this, this is not gonna end well. This is, we're gonna lose the Great Barrier Reef. That's really, I think, the logical 
not just the Great Barrier Reef, obviously there are many people here from other countries. There are so many countries that are absolutely dependent on their coral reef systems for their fisheries. Those countries are going to suffer immeasurably and that is what's going to happen. So accept that, but then move beyond it to work for positive change despite the potential for failure. And that comes from some really important work. If you're not aware of it, I'd highly recommend it. Joanna Macy was a um, lady who wrote about despair and empowerment in the um, 1960s and 70s. And, and her original work was about um, nuclear war and the threat that, you know, in the 60s and 70s, people believed that there was, you know, a nuclear war was imminent and that, you know, that, that the world was going to destroy itself. So Joanna Macy, very, very powerful writer, working around despair and empowerment. And she's gone on to now talk about climate change and environmental threats, not just nuclear threats. So her work um, is really around um, active hope. So her three, just to, to summarise, you can read her books. She's got multiple books and a website. Um, practice that sustains active hope, take a clear view of reality, identify our vision for what we hope will happen and take active steps to help bring that vision about. But the acceptance that you know, we could fail is an important first step to then going on and working beyond that and not just thinking, I must be crazy. Uh, you're not. It is rational to think that this is going to get bad. And hope is an essential part of success. Um, one common denominator for denial and despair. So if we deny there's a problem, we say climate change isn't real, it's not happening, you know, those crazy people. Um, so if you deny there's a problem, crazy people like, you know, our Deputy Prime Minister and multiple members of, m multiple politicians and the President of the United States and pretty well everyone who works for him, crazy people like that. Um, if you deny there's a problem, um, at one end of the spectrum. If you despair about a problem, say, you know, there's nothing we can do, we might as well give up, the common denominator for those two ends of the spectrum is that you don't have to do anything about it. If you deny it's a problem, it's not a problem, so you don't need to do anything. If you despair about it, you also don't have to do anything about it because you think it's hopeless. Now those, you know, lack of action isn't an option because there isn't another planet that we are going to. There isn't some other planet we are going to give on to our kids. As far as we know it, the rest of humanity is going to live out its existence where we are right now on planet Earth. And if we don't look after it, you know, whatever we hand on to them is what they get. So um, there's no plan B, there's no planet B, and there's nowhere else our kids are going. So we have to do whatever we can and whatever we can save you know, if your research can save a bit of it, then good on you. So finally, the fifth strategy is to choose to use the skills and tools you have to save what you can. Choose to fight to protect the people and places you love. And choice here, um, again, I'm drawing upon some really famous uh, and really well-known concepts um, uh, originally um, Posed by Viktor Frankl, his whole logo school of philosophy around um, and psychology around logotherapy or the study of meaning, and um, the, the title. Um, apologise for the um, the non-inclusive language. Man's search for meaning. It was originally published in 1946. Frankl had been a German Jew. He was interned in Auschwitz and in other concentration camps for years, and while he was there, he saw many. Um, people who despaired and he, he wrote about it afterwards and said if they despaired they quickly died. And what he tried to do to the um, inmates was to give them um, meaning to say you know if there was someone who um, had lost their child or they didn't know where their child was then the simple thing he would say to them then you need to survive this so you can go and find your child and find out if they are okay. You need That's your purpose. and. He founded this school of um, psychology around meaning and giving meaning to what we do. And I, I found it a very, very powerful book when I was an undergraduate in searching for meaning. And I think it is an incredibly important question that we all face. And I, I really think it's a valuable book. If you haven't read it, highly recommend it. Um, a world, or really a world classic.
if we choose to fight, we can do incredible things. So Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and his famous um, speech in um, Washington, I have a dream. And I love this quote from Nelson Mandela. Every important change in history was impossible until it happened. We need to fight for the future we want. And being nice and expecting others to be reasonable and that our governments will take action necessary to prevent climate change is not working. Um, we need to fight on the beaches, as Churchill would say. And, and in this context, um, I don't mean fighting as acts of aggression going and blowing something up. I mean actively working to avoid bad outcomes through non-violent political, public, and personal actions. So basically don't accept unacceptable behaviour or government policies. And don't give up, so keep fighting. To wrap up, we've got this big problem and you have to deal with it. Um, so I've suggested five strategies um, for coping. The first three are generic for dealing with despair. Um, and um, the last two are really more focused on this particular problem of climate change. We're all facing it, going to face it through our careers. So um, I'd like to um, ask if you've got any questions, but I really want to also ask you if you are comfortable to um, suggest any strategies that you have for dealing with these issues. And if you're not comfortable, that's completely fine. And I just go back, so to give us some focus, if you've got something that you think here is right, then great, um, and you can give us your personal example. Or if you think that there's something else that you think is a really good strategy, then I'd love to hear it as well. Yeah. Thank you very much for this thought-provoking presentation, and I also really like the layout. Um, that was beautiful. Um, I wanted to say this. So I thought your approach was from a um, human-centric environmentalism, view of environmentalism. And I have friends, but I've also read about this, that take this uh, view of um, the environmental movement um, sort of from the perspective of the earth and the ecosystem. And they say, they're not desperate, they're not desperate and they're not deniers, mm -hmm. but they say, well, we as humans, we're really the terror of the ecosystem. We're not good. So if doomsday is coming, bring it on. Mm. So what did you think about that, that kind of view? Because I, I hear it, you know, it's present yeah. in the environmental discourse. I, I disagree. I think that sort of nil, nihilism mm -hmm. of you know, let's just bring it on and wipe out the human species. I, you know, I, I think it, for all our faults, humanity is amazing. And, um, you know, and you think about all the people that you love, you know, desperately love, not just, you know, a romantic partner, but, you know, children or your parents and then all of your friends. And then think about the millions of people, the billions of people and all of their lives and not just Presently, you know, we've got billions of people on the planet, but we're really talking about the rest of humanity. You know, humans are being around as a species for about 200,000 years. So, um, you know, we're, we're looking at something like, um, what is it, about 8,000 generations, if you look at, you know, and we're looking now, what we're doing now will affect the rest of humanity. So the, the carbon that we're putting, we're burning and putting into the atmosphere, will continue to circulate through the carbon system for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. So what we do now affects the rest of humanity. Billions of people hopefully will come after us. And there is so much joy and so much love and so many fantastic things. And I also want to protect coral reefs, um, but to me, I completely disagree with let's just let it all go to rack and ruin. And uh, I just, uh, I feel no, not, not in any way. Um, and it's certainly not something that is going to inspire any change in the world. You know, if we can, what we can save, um, you know, even if people don't want to save other people, well, what about the corals? What about the, you know, the other wonderful species that we inhabit this um, planet with? I just think it's so important. So, no. I don't agree, but I don't
don't even, I wouldn't even say that I respect their right to have an opinion because I don't um, uh, respect that right. I, I just, it's like to me, um, like terrorism for instance, like I res respect other religions um, but as soon as people start blowing others up then I don't respect that. That's not a um, legitimate um, extension of, a, of respect. And I just think respect and, and love are such an important components of our, our lives. So. Thank you. But thank you for the point. Yes? Chris, first of all, thanks for bringing up mental health. It's a really critical part for, I think, our postgraduate students. And it's something that we need to talk about more, particularly on this PhD and postdoc level. It, it is really important. I'm glad you brought it up. And I hope that means we talk about it a lot more. Um, the second thing, the point that you arrived at there, how much do you think the challenge that you're looking at can be addressed by bringing back that intrinsic link that humans have you know, with nature and the sure. environment and understanding that That's a fantastic, unless you yeah. have that in place, you don't have an economy and you don't have yep. society because multiple indigenous groups have that connection, but it just, I mean, it's kind of my advice you, but it seems to have gone. I mean, yeah, is it, is Ma it even possible to rebuild yeah. that? Like, that is such a fantastic question. Uh, thank you for it. Uh, I think that that link is so important. And I remember um, I, I went down to do, as I mentioned, being part of Al Gore's program years ago. And I remember we met in Sydney, um, and he took us from the place where the um, meeting was to be held, and he took us out into a park, and his first um, part of the of the training program was to talk about connection and to think about the place that you love and to think about how special that is in your connection with it and he's really emphasized that connection to country if you were, if you were a um, traditional um, owner or connection to a place is just so important from his philosophy and I think that you know that's why I put up the Wit Sundays um, initially because I wanted to show you my connection and what I was looking to protect and I fully agree with you that connection is critical. Um, in terms of the broader society question, uh, I, I fully agree that loss of connection and that loss of feeling is a crucial ga gaping hole that we have linked with a uh, culture built around neoliberalism at, at the present time which is anti-government and basically basically rule of the jungle, um, you know, uh, built around private profits and not essentially a, a collective benefit for society. So there are many forces that are, you know, impacting on this. Um, I fully agree that um, and the need to re-establish connection is, is a critical component. Um, and I could talk more about that, but I don't want to... Um, Dwell on. Can I just say, I, I've, I, something that's been I've been dwelling on for many years is trying to is writing an article for a really good journal. I've been thinking something like um, one of the you know one of the high, high end journals in communication. But to me, the big um, we need good um, narratives and good uh, metaphors um, to respond to the. Um, jobs versus environment dichotomy that is just so prevalent in our culture. You know, it's, it's like this Adani mine, it's all about the jobs. And if you're against it, well, you're against jobs. And you're against, you know, the royalties that pay for our universities and hospitals and the like. And I just think that that is such a false dichotomy. And to me, the narrative needs to be built around some simple concepts um, like, uh, you know, nature is the foundation for all of our prosperity, so foundation. And also I've got a more complicated metaphor that I use in, um, in uh, lectures where I show um, essentially the roots of a tree going up and the fruit being things like jobs, um, clean air and water, you know, safe families, and those sorts of things is the fruit of the tree. And then the roots have um, governance and, um, you know, uh, and education and then the taproot 
is a healthy environment. So essentially it's building a big metaphor around that these aren't actually inconsistent um, things, jobs in the environment, that a healthy environment is the, is the taproot that maintains jobs or foundation. So those sorts of, I think uh, we need to improve our narratives for why environment is so important. Uh, does that? Okay, so um, I'm conscious of time. It's right on five o'clock. Is there, um, do we have any more questions? Can I just say, I think that's probably a good PhD project. <laughs> well, communicate, yeah, communication well, and also narrative. identifying the bottlenecks. I mean, I've worked in, most of my life, I've worked in developing countries. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like the term developing countries because it yeah. brings with it a certain perspective, yeah. yes, which yes. is very Western, right? Very us. Yes. Um, but the reality is those people are typically more intimately related to the environment, be it simply because they don't have the buffering technologies or the grain silos yeah. or the banking facility, if you want to call it that. Right? Yeah. But I know communities I've worked with, when you go in and you, you demonstrate clearly, if you do that, you will have a negative feedback on your community. Mm. They respond. Yes. It's not beyond the human psyche to respond. Yes. I, I just think there's a very nice set of research in there about why don't we respond? Yes. And we don't ask that question. Yes. We acknowledge we don't, yes. but we don't ask why. Yes. And I just think that would be very interesting to look at. Mm. Um, is there a question? Um, yeah, I just wanted to touch on the, um, the strategies. Um, quite often, so I'm in my third year PhD, technically on paper, I think I'm a little bit far behind, but um, <coughs> Um, people often say... That oh, probably is be. everyone who's behind in their PhD. <laughs> I just don't, don't. People often say, oh, you know, I can't socialise, I can't do this, that and the other. And in fact, I've actually revved up my socialising. I feel like I need that support. Yes. Um, I've got a young child, she's six and a half. Yep. And so I'm going to go home, you know, in about an hour and, you know, do the whole parenting thing. And mm -hmm. I was finding that I was just really just basically drowning and have like half an hour in the evening by the time she'd go to bed. Mm -hmm to sort of do whatever, but I'm too tired. Mm -hmm. And so the organising committee, Friday's typically an hour brook day, uh, yes. my mental health day, uh, six hours that I get to do whatever I want while my daughter's at school. Um, so instead I actually work Sunday. So I have Saturday off with my family. And That's fantastic. It sounds like you've got your strategy for <laughs> so And can I just say, selfish, but I'm completely you know, I like in awe here. of you able to handle a small child and a PhD. I was probably Ron's model of, you know, the PhD was done before children and I'm always amazed at people, even the people just doing postgraduate studies or any studies really, um, and handling a small child. It's just amazing. So well done. Um, yeah. So you, you, you're very good at scheduling. Sorry? I say congratulate me when I finish. Well, look, you've, you've got a... Um, you know, can I start? I'd go back to that first point I made. You know, be kind to yourself, and don't. You know, the, you, what you're doing is amazing, and you know, without just patting yourself on the back, you know, recognise that and really embrace it, and don't beat yourself up that you know you're not meeting a PhD milestone or the like. Obviously, you know, it needs you need to get there, but it doesn't. Um, sometimes it's about surviving um, the point that you're at, and yeah. So well done. Uh, are there any other questions or comments or suggestions? Well, thank you very much and thank you for those um, uh, comments and suggestions and feedback, it's really useful. I'll, um, I've recorded this and I'm going to just um, put it up and I'll put the link available so that it's part of the resources <coughs> for, um, for the uh, HDR um, group um, going forward. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you.